all right, everybody. Now that we've talked about differences in pressure and how they give us wind in the first place, now we're going to talk about some of the other forces that impact the wind and how they relate to one another, how they balance one another out. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about the differences between upper level winds and surface winds. Um, and we're also going to be talking a lot about measuring wind in this, in, in this lecture. So really this lecture sort of puts together and builds on everything that we learned in the last lecture. So if you haven't had a chance to watch lecture 21, go back and, and watch it. Make sure that you take notes, make sure that you have a little bit of an understanding before we jump into this lecture. So <clears throat> the goals for this lecture are first to talk about the Coriolis and friction forces. Um, then we're going to talk about upper level winds and compare them to surface winds. And I'll talk a little bit more about upper level maps versus surface maps. And then we're going to talk about the ideas of cyclonic and anti-cyclonic motion. Um, and how this relates to high and low pressure systems. And then we'll end today's lecture by talking about how wind is measured. Now before we jump in, let me give you a quick 30,000 foot flyover of what we've talked about so far. So, in the last lecture, we started out by talking about Newton's laws. And there are two key laws that I want you to be comfortable with. Um, the first law is called the law of inertia. And the idea here is that if I take an object and I set it in motion, and then there's no net force that acts on it, so all the net forces cancel each other out, the object will stay in motion unless it's acted upon by some net force. Now, as I said, here on Earth, if you set an object into motion, there's usually friction acting upon it, there's drag from the air, gravity is pulling it down, and so we usually don't see too many instances of inertia here on the surface of the Earth. Now, that's not to say that there aren't any, but they're just not as common. Um, and then the other law that I want to talk about is Newton's second law, which states that the net force acting on an object is equal to the object's mass times acceleration. And the idea here is that assuming that the mass of the atmosphere stays the same, which is a really good approximation, um, the net forces that act on the wind act to accelerate the wind. And when I say acceleration, I mean one of three things, either speeding the wind up, slowing the wind down, or changing the wind's direction. And we're actually going to talk today a little bit about how these forces slow the wind down and change the wind's direction. Now in the last lecture, we talked about the first force I want to uncover, and that was the pressure gradient force. And the pressure gradient force is the force responsible for speeding the wind up. And dare I say, if we had no pressure gradient force, we would have no wind. And the pressure gradient force is caused by differences in pressure. And winds flow from areas of high pressure, that's regions that have more air above them, to regions of low pressure, that's areas that have less air above them. So it's kind of like a redistribution. We have two uneven pressures, and air moves from the higher pressure to the lower pressure until the two are equal. And the differences in pressure are caused by differences in temperature. Um, if you don't remember from the last lecture, go back and review the two-column model. It is, it is a fundamental concept in meteorology, it's something that I use in my everyday life, believe it or not, and it actually is something that we see on a daily basis when we experience a sea breeze or whenever we experience any kind of, any kind of storm system. That storm system was triggered via a process called cyclogenesis that actually starts with the two-column model. So um, go back and review that. And then the last thing we talked about was this idea of the strength of the pressure gradient force is determined by two things. The difference between high and low pressure and the distance between high and low pressure. And we talked about how to calculate that. So determine the difference, divide it by the distance. We also talked about how to see that qualitatively by looking at a weather map 
and looking at where isobars are close together. And that represents an area of a higher pressure gradient and hence stronger winds. On the other hand, where isobars are really far apart, that represents a region of low pressure gradient and hence weak winds. But with that said, once the winds begin to speed up, once they begin to accelerate due to the pressure gradient force, something else begins to happen to them. If you've ever taken a look on a weather map, or if you've ever taken a look at a time lapse of, of a weather satellite, or even looked at a hurricane, you would notice that there's a lot of swirling going on. Um, I'll actually post a, a video of this in the comments below and hopefully that'll help you understand it a little bit more. But here's what's actually happening. As the wind begins to accelerate, as the air begins to accelerate, it starts to experience another force called the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is caused by the rotation of the Earth. So, believe it or not right now, as you're sitting down in your chair watching this video, or sitting down wherever you're at watching this video, or standing, um, you are planted on a planet that is rotating at a speed of about a thousand miles per hour at the equator, and slower and slower the further away you get from the equator. Because of this constant rotation, and the difference in rotation from the equator to other regions, there's actually a deflection that occurs. And this deflection is called the Coriolis force. So here's how this force works. So imagine you have a friend and the two of you stressed out about our next midterm are deciding, you know, let's get the kid in us out. Let's go to a park and plan a merry-go-round. And so you and your friend are on a merry-go-round and you see a ball and you decide to start tossing it to one another. But the merry-go-round's not spinning at this point. So you're on the merry-go-round, it's stationary, and you toss the ball to your friend. Well, assuming that you toss the ball in a straight path, the ball is going to travel straight from you to your friend. And that's to be expected. I mean, that's how, that, that's how this works. Well, let's suppose another friend comes by and they see you on the merry-go-round and they say, you know, why don't you guys make this a little bit funner? And they begin to rotate you. They actually begin to rotate the merry-go-round. And then let's say you start at this position right here and you throw the ball to your friend. Well, because the platform beneath you is rotating, your position is going to change. Not only that, but your friend's position is also going to change. So even though you threw the ball straight, due to the rotation of the Earth and the change in the Earth's position, the ball looks like it deflects relative to you and your friend. So in a sense, because we're here on the Earth and we are rotating, we are changing position, this causes the air above us, even if it's traveling in a straight line, to deflect relative to us. And what I really want you to get, I mean, that's more the derivation, that's more the explanation. But what I really want you to get is the Coriolis force changes the wind's direction. And I have the word steering here. Steering might not be the best word to use, but it's also the quickest. Um, it's changing the wind's direction. So when I say steering, I mean changing the wind's direction. Um, you can steer a car and it's going straight, but um, it changes the wind's direction. Now, what direction does it change it? Well, it actually depends on the hemisphere you're in. If you live here in the northern hemisphere where I live, um, if you live in the United States or Europe or um, North America, Central America, um, most of Asia, practically all of Asia, um, and the northern part of Africa, you're in the northern hemisphere. So if you live north of the equator, you're in the northern hemisphere. And up here, the Coriolis force turns the wind 
to the right of its initial path. So in a sense, the wind is traveling straight and the Coriolis force steers it, it changes its direction, it turns it to the right of its path here in the Northern Hemisphere. The interesting thing, however, is if you were to jump across the equator and go into the Southern Hemisphere, it actually turns it to the left there. And usually the way I tell my friends or tell my students how to remember this is in the Southern Hemisphere, think of Beyonce. To the left, to the left, everything you own in the box to the left, that's in the Southern Hemisphere. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's reverse Beyonce. To the right, to the right. Jay-Z, you can move back, come in to the right, I guess. Um, sorry about the lame Beyonce joke, but, um, but it does make sense, though. So, the Coriolis force turns the wind to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, one area of common confusion that a lot of my students get here, though, is when they hear the word to the right, they always think of to their right. But think about this. Let's say you were facing me right now. You know, the two of us are facing each other. And I told you to point right. And you stretched out your right hand and you pointed to your right. That would actually be to my left. If we are sitting across from each other and you point to your right, you're actually pointing to my left. And the same thing is true with me. If I'm pointing to my right, that is to your left. So which one is right? Which one is the right answer here? Well, it's actually to the wind's right in the Northern Hemisphere. So for example, using my little pen here, let's say the wind is traveling up this way. So the wind is traveling up that way. The Coriolis force, and I'll draw it in blue, would be directed, sorry, this video software sometimes makes the cursor disappear. Here we go, it's directed to the wind's right. So the wind was traveling up and the Coriolis force turns it to the right. Now on the other hand, Let's suppose instead that the wind was traveling down like that. Well, believe it or not, the Coriolis force would turn the wind this way. Even though that's your left, it's the wind's right. I'll do one more example. Let's say the wind is traveling this way. Well, the Coriolis force would turn the wind down this way. The wind is traveling this way. The Coriolis force turns it to its right. So that's how the Coriolis force, force works. And then in the southern hemisphere, it's to the left. So, again, the reason why this happens is because we are rotating. We are on a planet rotating, and this rotation causes, even though the wind is traveling in a straight path, it causes us to view the wind as rotating. Um, even though the wind is still traveling straight, but because we're moving, it seems that the wind is deflected. So there's a cool video here, and I've actually posted it on a link, a YouTube link right here, and I'll also post this in the comments as well. But what actually determines how strong the Coriolis force is? Well, many people think that the Coriolis force is somehow responsible for the liquid in their toilet bowl, the water in their toilet bowl, swirling the way that it does, or like swirling motion in your sink. Well, I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, that's not the case. But let me talk about what is happening. So the strength of the Coriolis force, how far it steers you, sorry, how far it turns you to the right, 
here in the Northern Hemisphere actually depends on three key things. The first thing is the latitude. And if you recall, latitude is distance from the equator. So if you are right on the equator, there is no Coriolis force. There's no deflection. However, the further away you travel from the equator, the stronger the Coriolis force becomes. It's weak near the equator, stronger near the poles. The second important thing is the speed of the wind. The faster the wind is rotating, the stronger, sorry, the faster the wind is moving, the stronger the Coriolis deflection will be. So think about it, if you were lobbing the ball towards someone, it may experience a very weak deflection. On the other hand, if you hurled it at it, if you threw it really hard, it would have a much stronger, much greater deflection. And this is one of the reasons why, if you've ever seen a hurricane, it looks like the center of that hurricane is spiraling really rapidly. It's because in the center of that hurricane, near the center, the winds are rotating really fast. And that's why these kind of storms have tight spirals. And this image right here, this is of what's called a mid-latitude cyclone. And yet in the center, the winds are traveling so fast that the Coriolis force is really strong. The last thing is the size of the motion. One of the reasons why you never feel a Coriolis effect pulling you is because we are too small. We are too small. So if you're driving down the street, there's a reason why you don't feel the Coriolis force turning you to the right. Because your car and the direction you're traveling is just too small. And unfortunately, this is why your toilet bowl, the swirling in your toilet bowl, isn't due to the Coriolis force. So what you saw in The Simpsons is incorrect. It has nothing to do with the Coriolis force. Um, it just has to do with the way that the water is being jetted out. So now I've talked about the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. And these two forces actually have major impacts on the wind. However, if you are in the upper atmosphere, these two forces are pretty much it. They're the two forces, they're, they're, they're the two net forces that really influence a parcel of air. These are the two forces that really act on a parcel of air. And in the upper atmosphere, as the pressure gradient force accelerates wind towards low pressure, the speed of the wind becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Now remember though, as the wind becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, as it becomes stronger, the Coriolis force becomes stronger. And remember, the Coriolis force is turning the wind to the right of its direction. So here's what's actually happening. Um, what's actually happening is, if you start with a particle of air at rest, at rest, there is zero Coriolis force. Why? Because the wind isn't moving. However, the moment you release this particle of air, it begins to accelerate to the low pressure. This is due to the pressure gradient force. As the wind accelerates towards the low pressure, its speed gets faster and faster and faster. As the speed becomes faster and faster, the particle begins to turn to the right. So initially it starts at rest. It begins to accelerate towards the low pressure as it begins to accelerate, the Coriolis force begins to steer to the right. The faster the wind goes, the more it steers it towards the right. What eventually happens is you get a situation where the wind is traveling straight. The pressure gradient force is directing it up towards the low pressure. In this case, let's suppose that this is a north-south map. So the wind was moving towards the north. The pressure gradient force is accelerating the wind to the north, but the Coriolis force begins to steer it to the east. 
North is at the top, South is at the bottom, East is on the right, West is on the left. So the wind begins accelerating towards the east now. Well, eventually what happens is, as the wind gets, as the wind begins to speed up, the pressure gradient force doesn't really change. Remember, the pressure gradient force is determined solely by difference in distance. In this image I'm drawing here, the difference in the distance between this high and low pressure isn't really changing. However, as the wind is accelerating, as the wind is accelerating, the Coriolis force is turning it to the right. Well, eventually what happens is you have a particle traveling due east. The pressure gradient force is pushing it to the north. The Coriolis force is pushing it to the south. And the two end up balancing each other out. And this is what is called geostrophic balance. Geo represents earth, strophic represents turning. And the idea here is that the pressure gradient force is now balanced out by the Coriolis force. And so that's what's happening here. The pressure gradient force is now balanced out by the Coriolis force. And in the upper atmosphere, this is a common occurrence. And in this case, wind is flowing parallel to straight-lined isobars. And these are what are called straight line winds. So this is happening in the upper atmosphere. There's a, there's a nice little movie here that depicts this. Let me see here if I can get it to play. Um, let's see here. Okay. And and here we go. So let's take a look at what's happening here. So let me explain it. So first, we're in the upper atmosphere. And the upper atmosphere is anywhere above 1,000 meters. due to horizontal differences in air pressure. An air parcel, initially at rest and above the frictional influence of the surface, will begin to move from a region of higher pressure toward a region of lower pressure due to the pressure gradient force. Once the air begins to move, the Coriolis force in the northern hemisphere bends the moving air to the right of its path until the Coriolis force balances the pressure gradient force. At this point, the wind flows parallel to the straight line isobars or contours and is called a geostrophic wind. Now one of the things I'm sure you're thinking about when thinking about the geostrophic wind is, wait a second. So the pressure gradient force is tugging the wind up towards the north. The Coriolis force is tugging the wind to the south and they're canceling each other out. Doesn't that mean that there's no net force acting on the object? Well, yes, that's true. The net force is zero. However, and then so your next thought might be, okay, well, Terrence, doesn't that mean that the wind shouldn't be moving? Well, then we have to go back to Newton's first law, the law of inertia. And in the law of inertia, it states that when an object is set in motion, it will remain in motion unless it's acted upon by a net force. Well, up to this point, there had been a net force that was greater than zero, and so the particle was accelerating. It was going faster and faster and faster. At, and then once the wind reached geostrophic balance, that net force went away. But the object was already set in motion. So per, initial, or per, per inertia, the wind remains in motion. One interesting thing that happens, though, is let's say, let's suppose that the isobars suddenly get closer together. Well, if you recall from the last lecture, when the isobars get closer together, that represents a stronger pressure gradient force. 
and hence the wind begins to accelerate again. The wind begins to accelerate again. And at this point, the Coriolis force quickly picks up and geostrophic balance is maintained. But think about it like a river. Let's say you have water in a river. And when the river is really, really wide, the, the water is flowing very gently. And then as soon as all this water channels into a narrow portion of the river, it quickly speeds up. The same thing happens if you've ever walked between two buildings on a, on a, on a windy day. So let's say you're in downtown San Jose and you're walking between two buildings, maybe on your way to your parking or your parking spot, or you're just walking between two tall buildings. Interestingly enough, the wind in between those two tall buildings can become much faster. Why? Because all the air is bunched up in there. The same thing happens in geostrophic balance. When these isobars get closer together, the wind speeds become much faster. Now this is all well and good for straight line winds. This is all well and good when these isobars are straight. But the reality is that this isn't the most common situation in the upper atmosphere. Usually most isobars have some curvature to them. And well, that curvature results in a new type of acceleration called centripetal acceleration. And basically what happens here is if the isobars are curved, the wind still flows parallel to them, but it's forced to change directions. Because the isobars aren't traveling straight anymore, the wind is no longer able to travel straight. And the reason why this happens is because as the wind continues to travel straight, the pressure gradient force is still tugging it towards that low pressure. It gets further away from the low pressure, and so the pressure gradient force tugs it towards that low pressure. That then causes the Coriolis force to be thrown slightly off balance. And so you get this minor imbalance between the two forces. The two forces end up in this never ending tug of war. And this causes the wind to curve. And this curvature is due to what's called centripetal acceleration. Now, one of the things I really want to clarify here is there is not a new force turning the wind. Rather, what is happening is as the wind is traveling, the direction with which it's being pulled at changes. So for example, let me actually draw this. So let's say I have a low pressure right here. All right, so I have a low pressure right there. And then let's say I have a particle of air. Well, and let's say that this particle of air is in geostrophic balance. So we know that the pressure gradient force would push the air up towards the low pressure. And the Coriolis force is going to tug the wind down. And let's just, for simplicity's sake, say that North is at the top of this, south is at the bottom. And we know that the net direction of the wind is going to just be straight. Well, here's what happens. Now let's let the wind travel straight. As it travels straight, it's now here. The pressure gradient force is still tugging the wind towards low pressure. But now, rather than low pressure being due north of this particle of air, the low pressure is now to the northwest. So it now tugs the particle to the northwest. The Coriolis force is still, at this point, directed downwards. But because of this tugging happening to the northwest, because these two forces aren't directed in exact opposite directions, that causes the wind to curve 
it causes it to curve a little bit to the north. And then the same thing happens right here. So let's say now where it's in its new position, the pressure gradient force is tugging it. Now it's tugging it almost due west, and the Coriolis force is tugging it down to the southeast because the particle was traveling let me draw that right here the particle was traveling this way and then this causes the net wind to travel due north in this case it causes it to travel due north and so this process continues and this causes the wind to continue to turn the same thing actually happens. Let's say you have um, a ball on a string and you're, and you're twirling the ball on the string. You, you are swinging it around. Well, the tension of you pulling on that rope causes the ball to continuously curve. And that's what's called centripetal acceleration. It's not due to a new force. It's just due to a change in the balance between the other two forces. Now this isn't really called geostrophic balance in this case. In this case the wind is called gradient. The wind is still traveling parallel to the isobars but because now the isobars are curved the wind travels parallel to those curved isobars. Putting this all together we actually get an interesting situation. So here's what's actually happening. Around an area of low pressure, winds will rotate counterclockwise here in the Northern Hemisphere. They will rotate counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. This is actually what we call cyclonic flow. So when you put together the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force, and the fact that the two are constantly changing directions due to the wind's rotation, this creates this cyclonic flow. Now the same thing is true for anticyclonic flow. The only thing that's different is now the wind is rotating clockwise around a high pressure system. But the same tug of war between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force is still happening. It's still happening and so the wind just rotates counterclockwise, or sorry, it just rotates clockwise around high pressure. Now one thing I should stress really quickly is these directions switch in the southern hemisphere. Why? Because the Coriolis force switches in the southern hemisphere. So in the southern hemisphere, winds rotate clockwise around low pressure, counterclockwise around high pressure. But cyclonic flow, counterclockwise around low pressure in the northern hemisphere, anticyclonic flow clockwise around high pressure in the northern hemisphere. And these two patterns, this straight line pattern due to geostrophic balance, and then the curvature due to the gradient wind, put together the two things we need to know about upper level winds. In the upper levels of the atmosphere, there are two types of winds, zonal winds and meridional winds. Well, if you have a map, zonal winds travel in a straight east-west direction, whereas meridional